Hi, so I'm going to be talking about uh, the Umbra effect and in particular about experimental proposals uh, for detecting it. Uh, that title means something if you know what the Umbra effect is, but if not, I will um, go over that shortly. I remember in, in my PhD interview around three years ago, I asked the same question, what is the Umbra effect? And the answer my supervisor gave was, it's the poor man's hawking effect, but <laughs> that only know, means something if you know more about the Hawking effect. So I hope I'll give a slightly uh, more intuitive explanation as to what it is. So um, I'm from uh, the Gravity Laboratory at the University of Nottingham, uh, run by Silke Weinfortner. And just as a small overview of the things we do, we like looking at analog gravity. So um, analog gravity is um, a field that's around 40 years old now. So uh, in comparison to the previous talk of mock gravity, where are um, in an analog gravity system. So um, this is an experiment with a two fluid model of uh, immiscible fluids that when you shake it and look at um, how the uh, interfacial waves um, settle down, um, this is uh, mathematically similar to um, the early universe uh, preheating and then the, um, well, giving rise to early structures. And then this is a, a more popular experiment. It is effectively a large bathtub. But the special thing about it is that we can have um, great control over uh, the flow. And by looking at waves on the surface, this can be similar to how quantum fields interact uh, with a black hole. And finally, our more new experiments. Uh, this is our cryostat for making superfluid helium-4. We hope to reproduce um, this uh, sort of experiment in an inviscid fluid environment. And uh, you'll see in a moment why that is important. So the overview of this talk is I will first introduce the Umbra effect and analog gravity. And then I'll discuss the first proposal that we made in 2020, which was uh, to detect the Umbra effect in a Bose-Einstein condensate. And then uh, move on to uh, modeling with a non-zero ambient temperature. And finally, talk about our more recent proposal that we should hopefully uh, submit uh, next week on using superfluid helium-4. So uh, first, we'll talk about uh, the Umbra effect and analog gravity. So the Umbra effect is um, the principle that uh, accelerated motion and inertial motion are characteristically very different. And you can get um, uh, characteristic differences between an uh, observer who isn't moving and one who is moving with an acceleration. In particular, uh, we can model it using what we call an Umru DeWitt detector. Let's effectively imagine a person that has a, a two-state atom. If it's excited, it's um, seen something, and if it um, goes back down, it is uh, emitting or, de um, or goes under de-excitation. So if you um, are an accelerated observer and you're holding your atom and you look at the excitations and de-excitations uh, of your atom, it turns out that um, if you uh, plot this, um, you find that it's characteristic of a thermal spectrum. So the excitations and de-excitations obey uh, Einstein's detail of balance condition. And the temperature that you find is given by this Umru temperature, which is uh, h bar over 2 pi times the speed of light times the Boltzmann constant, all times by the acceleration. So this is an acceleration-dependent temperature effect. So any uh, inertial observer would see nothing. So the Umbra effect states that an observer who's standing still and an observer who is accelerating, and this is a linear acceleration in a straight line, will see completely different things in an otherwise vacuum universe. So uh, this comes with the caveats that your universe needs to have a zero ambient temperature, and you need to interact um, with your uh, fields for an infinite amount of time. But if you can do that, then this is what you expect to see. Now, this is a rather small effect. If you want to measure a one degree Kelvin change, you need an acceleration of around 2.5 times 10 to the 20 meters per second squared. Now, if you take um, an observer and you accelerate it at 10 to the 20, it might leave your lab pretty soon, so it's rather hard to detect. So. Um, People um, such as Bell and Lenos looked into a circular motion uh, version of this effect. Um, so you just, uh, in particular, they looked at the um, uh, excitations of an electron um, that is going around in circular motion, which again has constant acceleration. And they found a very similar um, uh, effect, except um, that the excitation, uh, so the energy gap, um, played an important uh, role so this um, original temperature was completely uh, gap independent. 
But in circular motion, you get um, what we might call a non-equilibrium temperature. Um, so now to analog gravity. So the OMRA effect was predicted in 1971, 1972, and 1976 by three people, uh, Davies, Fulling, and Unruh. And then in 1981, uh, Unruh figured out that um, if you uh, look at some inviscid fluid, so described by the Euler equations, and you considered perturbations of this fluid, um, the uh, equation describing it is exactly the same as a scalar field, so a quantum scalar field in a gravitating background. So um, this became the basis um, of analog gravity where we could use uh, fluid systems, so inviscid fluids, which is why we want to look at uh, superfluid helium and BECs, in order to um, gain knowledge about otherwise inaccessible uh, relativistic and quantum field theoretic uh, regimes. So um, one of the benefits is that the speed of light is replaced by an effective speed of light, which is the speed of sound in your system. So what that means for your Unru formula, so for the temperature, instead of dividing by one over three times 10 to the eight, uh, you divide by a much smaller number, which means that you can get much smaller accelerations and hopefully yield a higher temperature. For example, um, if you look at some um, prototypical BECs, the, effect, uh, the effective speed of sound, uh, speed of light is 12 orders of magnitude smaller, which means the acceleration you require to see something is much lower. So now we can talk about this uh, BEC proposal. So the idea is that you couple a laser, basically this uh, laser pointer with your BEC, you spin it in circular motion and see what happens. So the schematic for this is um, we take a laser of uh, frequency omega L and then you modulate it into two uh, side bands and then remove the center band. And then um, after that, we take it uh, through a deflector, which will allow us to take it in circular motion and pass through uh, the BEC. So when you pass through the BEC, um, the uh, interaction between the laser and your BEC should generate uh, density uh, fluctuations. And these are the analog quantum fields that we want to look into. So by studying uh, these density perturbations, uh, we can uh, extract, hopefully, information about this acceleration dependence. But the way we get that is um, when the laser passes through, uh, these density perturbations will cause phase uh, changes or phase fluctuations in the laser, and that's really what we're interested in. And the reason we introduce two sidebands is they're oppositely detuned so that um, their uh, phase fluctuations will be in opposite directions so you can increase the sensitivity of your uh, system. However, um, this uh, is under the caveat of ignoring ambient temperature. We can do this in the system because the uh, predicted OMRU temperature and also the temperature uh, of the operational BEC are rather similar. However, in other systems um, that are, you might have an easier handle of, such as superfluid helium, this is no longer the case, and you have to consider the ambient temperature. So to do that, um, we started looking at uh, quantum uh, thermal quantum field theory um, in the same way that was introduced uh, yesterday. So these are formulae, however, they are more familiar than they look at first. So uh, the main body um, of the work is based on a correlation function. So phi is just a quantum field and a derivative is there so that it doesn't have an infrared divergence. But other than that, it's just a correlation function of your field at two different points. And if you take the Fourier transform of this, uh, then you get your power spectral density. Now this tiny subscript beta here is um, what is doing the work for us in um, adding this uh, ambient temperature. So we do a thermal expectation value uh, in terms of uh, the uh, density matrix formulation that was mentioned uh, yesterday. And we introduce a, um, uh, a new variable, which is E bar, which is just the energy gap um, of your uh, detector. So how high your um, atom needs to be excited uh, in order to see something. So um, we have uh, energy or equivalently frequency dependent power spectral density. And if you do that on your circular trajectory, you just get this closed form sum. So um, it's in terms of Bessel functions because it's in circular motion. And then you have uh, these uh, thermal factors. So the in one of the interesting parts about this formula is if you uh, send the temperature to zero and these two uh, go away, 
the only part that remains uh, is this top part, which is exactly the same as if you started with zero temperature and did the calculation um, trying to ignore everything. So we have a split of quantum fluctuations and uh, thermal contribution fluctuations as well. So um, by using this, uh, we apply it to a uh, systems that have a non-negligible finite temperature. So um, how do we extract a temperature? We, instead of looking at the response function and seeing, okay, what happens? Does this have uh, the characteristics of a thermal spectrum? We impose that it obeys the uh, Einstein detailed balance condition to define its effective temperature. Um, the motivation for doing this is if you do it, for example, in linear motion, you'll find uh, uh, the uh, background temperature, so it acts as a thermometer, or if you do it uh, in linear accelerated motion with zero ambient temperature, you recover the uh, Unruh motion, so um, the Unruh uh, temperature. So in this sense, it is a generalization of uh, Unruh's original argument. So um, as we can see, this temperature in general will be frequency uh, dependent, so we define a sort of non-equilibrium um, effective uh, temperature. So by um, putting all of this into play, we can uh, finally move on to uh, a superfluid helium-4 proposal. So the operational temperature of superfluid helium-4 is um, up to um, one Kelvin, but we'd like it below um, 500 microkelvin uh, for reasons that when you have a superfluid, it, part of it will evaporate and it gets a vapor. However, if it's cold enough, this vapor is saturated, and so there's no interaction between uh, the fluid and this vapor, which makes everything uh, much simpler. And if you have it cooler, you hope that your thermal effects are more ne negligible. However, if you have a 500 microkelvin uh, background and a potentially nanokelvin uh, unruh temperature that you're looking to detect, um, you can't ignore it. So um, what did we do? So we look at thin film uh, helium of around 100 uh, nanometer thickness. So by doing this, um, we generate uh, just um, on uh, uh, taking a substrate, you can um, have a thin film of helium and then you can uh, shine a laser uh, through it. And then you can look at, instead of density perturbations, there'll be height fluctuations in your field. So um, what was the result um, of doing this? So the, these are numerics, it, it's, the experiment hasn't been done, it's a, just a proposal. So uh, by looking at um, a fixed temperature, um, but a varying radius, um, we looked at, at a signal to noise ratio that um, isolates only acceleration dependent effects. So if you uh, rotate um, a laser through um, a DEC or through uh, superfluid helium, there will be velocity dependent effects and the UMRA effect um, will be effectively velocity independent, so you want to remove that. So by subtracting away um, the uh, linear contribution, uh, we identified a, a signal to noise ratio that should only tell you about the acceleration. And evidence that it does this is by uh, decreasing the radius of your circular trajectory, which is the equivalent of increasing the acceleration, we can see that our signal um, is increasing. And in fact, if we go to around a 30 micron trajectory, um, we get um, rather a large signal that we would like to uh, extract. So we can see um, here the uh, three uh, shapes. So these are um, the plots of these uh, three lines where the colors uh, match up to these. So as we increase the acceleration by decreasing the radius, we can increase our signal, which is exactly the signature of the Umru effect uh, that we are looking for. And uh, hopefully this will be submitted uh, next week. Um, but other than that, um, I'd like to summarize uh, what I was talking about today. So um, why, why is analog gravity important? Well, it allows us to um, bring otherwise inaccessible um, regimes uh, into the lab and we can observe them and probe them based on mathematical analogy. Um, we have two uh, prospective proposals. Um, for uh, measuring the UMRA effect in two very different regimes, one in a thermally dominated regime and one in a quantum dominated regime where the thermal fluctuations are very negligible. But in order to um, uh, 
do it most realistically, we would like to not ignore these uh, thermal effects. So by introducing thermal quantum field theory, uh, we can apply it and then get some uh, promising uh, predictions. So thank you very much for listening to my talk. Thank you.